in as much as Thanksgiving is coming up in just a few days' time, we thought we'd talk about gratitude and giving thanks. Something funny that relates, however loosely, to the topic. I'd like to share that with you. A elderly man who lived with his wife in Phoenix, Arizona, called his son in Chicago the week before Thanksgiving and told him, son, I hate to break this news to you, but your mother and I are finished. After 45 years of causing each other misery, we're going to call it quits. Call your sister in New York and break the news to her. So frantic, he called his sister in New York and she went ballistic. She said, they're not going to do any such thing over my dead body. She said, book a ticket to Phoenix right away. I'm going to do the same. We'll be there tomorrow morning. Then she called her dad. And she said, dad, don't you do a thing until me and my brother get there. We'll be there tomorrow. You understand? Don't do a single thing. The elderly man hung up the phone in Phoenix and turned to his wife and said, honey, Kids are going to be here for Thanksgiving, and they're paying for their own tickets. <laughs> Cicero said that gratitude is the greatest of all virtues. In fact, it is the parent of all others. We all have in our circle of acquaintances generally two types of people. People who count their blessings, people who are grateful that the Lord has made another day. And then, do you know any people that just take everything for granted? of assume that everything's there for them. There are three things that erode gratitude. There's pride, complaining, as well as carelessness. A good example of pride, in 1921, there was a huge earthquake in Japan which affected 45,000 square miles. Three-fourths of Tokyo, a city of seven million people, was shattered and leveled to the ground by the earthquake. 300,000 people died. Two and a half million people were homeless. Disease, despair, hunger, rode rampant throughout the island empire. The entire country was on the brink of destruction. And where should help come from but the United States of America? Food, clothing, medical supplies, and volunteers came by the shiploads. The American Red Cross, and remember this is 1921, collected $10 million from the people of the United States. Japan declared itself eternally grateful. There was an, even a proclamation by the Emperor of Japan which said that the people of Japan will be eternally grateful to the people of the United States of America. 1922, 32, 42, 21 years later, Pearl Harbor. That's what pride can do. Pride can erode gratitude. It's important to focus on what we have and not obsess and worry about all the things that we don't have. Madison Avenue Company, they tried an experiment. They dressed one of their young executives up like a homeless person, an old ratty coat, a hat, and sunglasses, and gave him a tin can and a sign that said, I'm blind. Went down on the street. All day long, he only collected $4. The next day, they sent the same man down with the same glasses, the same tin can, same ratty old coat to the same place. This time, the sign said, it's spring, and I'm blind. And that day, he collected $40 because people were reminded of what they had to be grateful for, that they had vision, they had eyes to see the flowers, the birds, the trees, the sunrise, and the sunset. When our forefathers founded this country and they had established the last Thursday in November as a day of thanksgiving, they were not so much thankful for something as they were thankful in something. Our talk is not that we're thankful for everything. A child dies of cancer, get into a horrific automobile accident. These are not things that we're necessarily thankful for. In fact, it's a little bit twisted to be thankful for things like that. But we can be thankful in everything, knowing that God can even use things that are meant for our harm, and He can transform them and change them to our good. In bounty or in want, the idea is to be thankful. In joy or in misery, 
be thankful. Let your gratitude not be contingent upon your own conditions, upon insistence of a certain set of circumstances, a certain standard of living. Let not your gratitude rest on things which are mutable. Let your gratitude rest on the solid rock of your creator, your gratitude towards God. That will never change. You may lose everything else. You may lose all your stuff, your bank balance, your house, your family, your health. You may lose all of that, but you can still be thankful because you have the Supreme Lord of millions and millions of universes, your well-wishing Heavenly Father accompanying you in the region of the heart. We had the British lion, symbol of power, said that at one time the sun never set on the British Empire. And we have the American eagle now, both symbols of power. But we should never forget that it was not by our own efforts we arrived where we are now. It was only by the grace of God. Our early coinage said, in God we trust. Without God's sanction, without God's benevolence, all of our efforts an ascension would have come to naught. In this connection, there's a story of a sage meditating in a lonely part of the Himalayas. He's deep in trance, his eyes are closed, and he feels a little pulling on his claw. He looks down, there's a mouse. He says, what do you want? Mouse says, cats are chasing me. Can you help me out here? So he's got some mystic powers by dint of his yoga and austerity. So he says, all right, become a cat. Goes back into his meditation, a couple weeks go by, and then again, looks down, there's the cat. Now what? Dogs are chasing me. All right, become a dog. A couple weeks later, there's again a tugging at his cloth, it breaks his meditation, he's annoyed. It's a dog is there. Now, what is it now? He said, tigers want to eat me. I said, all right, become a tiger. This time, instead of going away, the tiger was sitting there looking intently at the sage, licking his lips, yellow eyes, whiskers are twitching. Sage looks at him and says, you want to eat me? Tiger says, yes. Then punar mushika bhava. Punar means again, mushika means mouse, and bhava means become. Then again become a mouse. We should always be grateful, we should always be mindful that there, but for the grace of God, go you or I. We are where we are by God's grace and God's sanction. I read that successful, happy families with intimate, rich relationships, prosperous companies where the employees work harmoniously together, they have certain things in common. And the most important of them is not that there's no criticism. Sometimes we have to point out what people are doing wrong in order that they grow up and improve their performance. It's not that there's no criticism, but that the ratio of praise to criticism is four to one. That means every time anyone is called up short or taken in to see the boss and given a little constructive criticism to more than offset that, there are four instances in which they're praised and they're recognized and gratitude is being expressed to them for the job that they do. Here's a hypothetical. What if Krishna or God met us in the way that we treat him? What if God met our needs to the same extent that we give him our lives? What if we never saw another flower bloom because we grumbled when God sent the rain and ruined our golf day? What if God stopped loving and caring for us because we failed to love and care for him and for others? What if God took away his message because we wouldn't listen to his messenger? What if he wouldn't bless us today because we didn't thank him yesterday? What if God answered our prayers the same way we answer his call for service? What if God decided to stop leading us tomorrow because we did not follow him today? I think most of us agree we're not where God would like us to be. We're not where God would like us to be. Yet he doesn't handpick us. He doesn't harass us. He gives us room. He gives us space. He allows us to make wrong choices, always hoping that we'll grow up, that we'll mature, that we'll become the kind of men and women of character that can go back home 
and live with God in his kingdom eternally. Benjamin Franklin said, all happy people are grateful and ungrateful people cannot be happy. We tend to think that it's being unhappy that leads people to complain. But it's more true to say that it's complaining that leads people to becoming unhappy. Become grateful and you will become a much happier person. Otherwise, Benjamin Franklin said, any fool can criticize and most fools do. Does God need our gratitude? No, he's completely self-sufficient. He's called Ananda Maya Vyasa. He's full of bliss, knowledge, and eternity. He's not craving our attention. He's not craving our gratitude. But we need to give it. Learning to be thankful to God and to other people, parents, mentors, teachers, coaches, brothers and sisters, is the best vaccination against taking good fortune for granted. The less that you take for granted, the more pleasure and joy that you will feel in your life. Hans Sell, who is considered the father of stress studies, has said that gratitude produces more positive emotional energy than any other attitude in life. And here's an example of gratitude. Fanny Cosby wrote 8,000 hymns. 8,000 hymns glorifying God. Many of them are contained in your songbooks today. In fact, she wrote so many hymns that she had to write under several different pseudonyms just to see if she could get more songs of hers included into the hymn books. At six weeks of age, she had little eye inflammation. We all have it, little pink eye. They took her to the local doctor for treatment Carelessly, he used the wrong medicine on her eyes, and six weeks old, she became totally and permanently blind. When she became an old lady, someone asked her, if you were to meet that doctor again today, what would you say to him? She said, I would thank him with all my heart. Over and over and again, I would thank him for making me blind. She felt that her blindness was a gift for God without which she would not have been able to focus and write the hymns that flowed from her pen. When we opened this temple, this gorgeous temple, how, do, how did two Hare Krishna devotees come to an area that's 90% another religion with no money, no constituency, no devotees, no Indian community, because wherever we are, the Indian community they reflexively donate generously. And how do they build a temple on this level under those circumstances? And the answer is, they don't. We were right in the middle of it, but don't ask me how it happened. I don't know. I can't give you an answer. All I can say is that the grace of God. When we opened June 23rd, 2001, about 5,000 people came. Some of those people had donated. There was one Mormon doctor Dr. Frampton from Salem donated $3,000. The LDS Foundation donated $25,000. What a small Indian community there was at the time had donated money. Some people had come and volunteered, given their time to do unskilled tasks around the place. We figured about thirty dollars or $40,000 was saved just from volunteers having come in. But even if people didn't donate, even if people didn't come to work, we felt that there was a great wellspring of benevolence. We felt that the community was behind it, that they were sending positive vibrations, and that on one level or another, everybody, including, and not the least of which, is God, made this temple, manifest this temple. But, ironically, we got all the credit. 5,000 people came up to me throughout the day, and they congratulated me for opening the temple. And it was only one thing I could say to cover the situation. Thanks. Now, I wasn't saying thanks for your compliments. It was a double entendre. I was saying, of course, thanks for your compliments. Thanks for your appreciation. We all enjoy that. We all like to hear that. We all thrive in that. But thanks for what you did. Don't forget yourself. This was a community effort. We all had a part in bringing this temple to pass. So I just said thanks about 5,000 times, and I'll never forget that day. It was one of the best days of my life. 
Thanks is a million dollar word. It's a word that is too seldom heard and too rarely spoken and too often forgotten. How many times have someone shown gratitude or thanked you and in a false play of humility, you just, oh shucks, I'm nothing, I didn't do anything. No, be happy. Thank them for their thanks. Don't pretend that it doesn't mean anything to you. Rudyard Kipling is one of the few authors who became wealthy during his own lifetime from his own writings. Most authors die impecuniously and their work only becomes valuable posthumously. Rudyard Kipling actually became extremely wealthy during his own lifetime based on his literary endeavors. At one time, a cynical, young, wet-behind-the-ears reporter said, Mr. Kipling, I've done the numbers. I figured that you've made $100 for every word that you've ever written. And he pulled $100 out of his pocket and he held it kind of close to his chest. And he said, could you give me one of your $100 words right now? Without missing a beat, Rudyard Kipling's arm snaked out. He grabbed the bill, he put it in his pocket, and he said, thanks. It's not just a $100 word, it's a million-dollar word. If we would all adopt an attitude of thanksgiving in our lives, our lives would be changed. We would savor each and every day. I heard about this missionary. He went to the jungles of New Guinea, where he was stationed with a tribe, there was something about the environment there that caused the young men, generation after generation, to go blind in their late 20s. Nobody knew what had caused it. Their great-grandfathers had gone blind, 28, 30. Their grandfathers had gone blind. Their fathers had gone blind. And the current generation fully expected to lose their sight in their time just as the others had before. Now this missionary had had some medical training. He experimented with the flora and the flana in the local area and he started administering this antidote or this medicine to the young men. Lo and behold, they got to be 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. And it dawned on them that they had sidestepped the fate which had befallen all of their generations previous. Their joy was unbounded. The difference that this one missionary had made was incalculable. They called him in front of their tribal council. And they said, this is the most important, momentous thing that's ever happened in our history. We are so full of joy. We are so full of gratitude. We can barely contain ourselves. Only problem is, we don't have a word for thanks in our vocabulary. We're not going to let that stop us. We can so little contain ourselves that wherever we go, whoever we meet, we are going to tell everybody. We're going to make sure that everybody we meet anywhere, anytime is going to know your name. What did we just do to open our services? You all sat. It might have been somewhat mystifying to you. Why are these people singing the same words over and over again? Same principle. We are showing our gratitude. We are counting our blessings. We cannot contain our joy, our gratitude. It's not something that one squanders or keeps to oneself. By its very nature, it demands to be spread. It demands to be broadcast. God is great. God is good. God is benevolent. There's a reservation for each and every one of us in His kingdom if we live our life in faith. The best way to thank God is to say his holy names. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. If you have some other name of God that you prefer, that's fine. Get up in the morning and say the name of God. Go through your work and either out loud or under your breath, say the name of God. Say the name of God and ask for his strength and his wisdom in terms of parenting. Say the name of God and ask for his guidance in terms of your marital relationships. Say the names of God before you go into that meeting at the office. Say the names of God in the beginning, in the end, in the past, in the present, when you're happy, when you're sad, in the firmament, in the heaven. Say them when you get the chance with like-minded people with drums and cymbals and lute and lyres. Give thanks. This principle is not unique to us. 
The Sikhs have rented our Salt Lake City Center this coming Friday night for three hours for chanting. In their scripture, the Guru Granth Sahib, it says on every page, chant the names of Krishna, chant the names of Ram. The Sufis have kuala. It's very, very much similar to what we're doing. In Judaism, there is now a very, very popular man called the Kirtan Rabbi. Kirtan is a Sanskrit word. It refers to the chanting, and it literally means fame, to spread the fame. The Kirtan Rabbi sings the 99 names of God from the Old Testament with the harmonium, and all the young Jewish people in the synagogue get up and chant and dance, just like you did and like we're all going to be invited to do. The Psalms, that part of the Bible, which is the Psalms, is all about chanting. It's the same as Kirtan. There are many, many verses, and I'll just pick one of them to share with you. This is in Psalms 105, verse 1 through 4. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing songs unto him, talk ye of his wondrous works, glory ye in his holy name, let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord, seek the Lord, seek his strength and seek his face forevermore. David, he founded the city of Jerusalem. He brought the people. He conquered their enemies. They got the territory. They started building their residences. It was not fated to him to build the temple. That was his son Solomon. They had the Ark of the Covenant that they'd hauled all 40 years throughout the desert. And at any given time, it's explained, he had no less than 300 people singing their own version of Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. They were singing the Old Testament names of God with trumpets and drums and cymbals and thanking the Lord. That's the minimum number. In other words, if you went at 3 a.m. in the morning, there'd be 300 people. Possibly if you went at 3 p.m. in the afternoon, there would be three or even 30,000 people. And they would praise the Lord, saying, For He is God, for His mercy endureth forever. And it says that every evening to show how pleased the Lord was upon them for this practice of chanting, He descended as a cloud and mingled with them. And they could feel the presence of God. They would get goosebumps and their hackles would rise. Now, we have our festival colors every year. It's been about 15 years. We get 55,000 people over a two-day period. And from morning till night, the instrumental part of the bands might differ. We go with electronic dance music. We go with ska. We go with reggae. We go with hip-hop. We go with rap. The instrument, the style of music may differ from band to band, but they are all kirtan bands. That means they bring their musical talents and the lyrics are all Govinda Jaya Jaya, Gopala Jaya, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevai, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. People hear nothing but the names of the Lord from early in the morning till late at night. And every hour on the hour, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, there's a color throw and this big cloud goes up. And it's my fancy that's God showing his pleasure at this practice of chanting. Wally Pershons with the Utah County Sheriff's Office is a great guy, and he liaisons with us about the parking. He's never been to the Festival of Colors personally. But one day, Wally asked me, he said, Cheru, at your Festival of Colors, do the bands play uplifting songs? I said, no, Wally, they don't. It's far more than that. They sing the names of God all day long. And I believe that one of the reasons the festival is so popular is it addresses itself directly to the prime purpose for which we're created, for which we're put here. And I grant you that most of the young kids don't come with this purpose in mind, but nevertheless, the festival is organized in such a way that they get caught up in loving God with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all their mind. Concluding here, a couple of quotes from Prabhupada, our spiritual master. In the ordinary way, if someone gives me a glass of water when I am thirsty, it is etiquette, I say, thank you. God has given us so vast amount of water in the ocean, in the sea, and in the sky. Without water, we cannot live. He has given us, in addition, an abundance of light, the sun, moon, and stars. And yet, there is no thanksgiving. Rather, we say, God is dead. God expects nothing on our part for all of his kindness, only that we appreciate. 
If we express simple appreciation, that's all he asks of us, the almighty Lord of millions and millions of universes smiles in our direction. And Prophet says in another place, the truly devoted and spiritually mature persons do not thank the Lord only one day a year. They give their prayer of thanks every day and every waking moment. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Showing gratitude to the Lord by offering loving devotional service eternally. My challenge to you today is guard against the three things that erode gratitude. Pride, complaining, and carelessness. And remember that we did not get where we are on our own, lest we again become a mouse. If we'll get up every day with thanksgiving in our hearts, counting on God to deal with us a lot more graciously than we deal with Him, and to give us millions and millions of times more than what we could ever give back to Him, then we will reap the full fruits of joy, peace, purposefulness, fulfillment, and prosperity, which He has in store for us in this life, and in the next life, we'll go back home, back to Godhead. Thank you very much for your kind attention. If you receive this message, please repeat after me. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare.